Today is August 3rd, 2020, and my guest is author Margaret Heffernan. She is a professor of practice at the University of Bath, lead faculty for the Forward Institute's Responsible Leadership Program. Her latest book and the subject of today's conversation is Uncharted, How to Navigate the Future. Margaret, welcome to EconTalk. Thanks very much. It's great to be talking to you. So your book opens with uh, the story of three economic forecasters from the 1920s. They had a lot in common. Uh, tell us how they lived and how they forecast and what that has to do with your uh, the theme of your book, Uncharted. Sure. So these are the three men who I think are broadly considered to be some of the founding fathers of forecasting as an industry. And probably the best known of them is Babson, partly because of the college which he founded. And Babson really believed, and he was a fervent Newtonian and believed that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And he was really one of the first people in a whole line of um, economists who aspired to make economics really as pure a science as physics. So he really placed great, great faith in this Newtonian concept, if you like, what we would now call boom and bust. And he believed he had a way of kind of navigating the economy through those two extremes. Um, Irving Fisher, by contrast, was an academic. He was a man of immense young promise. And he was really very famous for his predictions and for providing advice to investors. And he was probably what today we would call a pundit, which is he had opinions about everything, not just financial markets, but um, things like how to uh, improve your own productivity and be healthier, you know, primarily through, strangely enough, eating grape nuts. And he thought the more you chewed, the more outstanding your athletic prowess would be. Something I remember this morning, having my grape nuts. Um, and the last of these uh, was Warren Persons. And Persons founded the Harvard Forecasting Service. And he was really the opposite of the other two in the sense that um, the other two had kind of theories from what, which they worked out kind of what they thought would happen. And um, really persons thought that you just had to be a master statistician, which he was and collect a vast amount of data, which he did. And he was really embedded in Harvard and later, thanks to his partnership with Keynes, uh, with Cambridge University. And the thing, the sort of strange fact that unifies all of these men, although obviously what unifies them is they're the founding fathers of forecasting, is that they also had an early um, brush with tuberculosis. And so what's very striking about them on a human level is they had a visceral understanding of uncertainty. You know, tuberculosis infected almost everybody at the turn of the century, um, particularly people who lived in cities. And the strange thing about it as a disease was and is that you could have a brush with it and never experience it again. It would simply lie latent and have no impact on your future well-being. Or you could at any moment in your life have a second episode and any one of those might kill you. So these were men who had a really deep and vested interest in trying to understand the future. They all had pretty quirky um, kind of responses in terms of how to maintain their healthy, um, how to maintain a really healthy lifestyle. So, you know, whereas Fisher believed in grape nuts, Babson believed in really cold weather, which since he lived in Massachusetts was pretty easy to rustle up. And there are these sort of hilarious pictures of him working through the winter in front of an open window, wearing this kind of long furry monk's habit of a gown. But I think the main thing is, you know, they weren't thinking of forecasting purely as an economic or scientific endeavor. You know, they really, really had a deep need to be able to, if not see the future, make the future. And it's really at this point that you find that, you know, they're thinking of forecasting, not just as gleaning what's out there, but if you think of the word and you think of a potter casting a pot, really trying to shape the future too by the kinds of advice that they gave people. So they're all intellectual giants in one way or another. They're all extremely eccentric. Um, and they're all very convinced that at this moment, 
there is an opportunity to turn forecasting into a profession because you have the telegraph, which means you can collect data all over the country, get people to send it to you. You have the capacity to um, analyze it because this is the beginning of, of really serious statistical analysis. And you have publications, which, which thanks to the railways, you can distribute all over the country. So there is now a burgeoning new market for forecasting too. And so all three of them, I think, are motivated by goodwill in the sense that they think forecasting will help people make better decisions. They're very entrepreneurial. They have a passionate desire to share information, believing that if it's available to everybody, this is especially true of Babson, um, then they won't be ripped off by people who have more information. Um, they're very, very confident of their pet theories, and they really all fail. Um, and part of the reason they fail is they make a lot of their predictions in the 1920s. And of course, <laughs> the Great Depression comes along, exactly. makes everybody look, you know. Well, it makes everyone except Babson look stupid, because ba but Babson gets it right for no other reason than that he's been forecasting a crash for three years running. Um, so at first, you know, he's hugely celebrated, and um, and and made famous by the fact that he got it right, and he uses that opportunity to buy up a lot of his failed competitors. But then he gets it wrong because at a, a couple of years later, he says, well, you know, we've had enough of this bus. So obviously a boom is due any time now. And it really wasn't. It was years and years away. But Babson, it has to be said, is the one of these three who does end up and die a wealthy man. So I, I, I want to talk a little bit about your armchair theorizing on the psychology of, of these people, because I think it applies to all of us as individuals. Your book's about the fact that the future is unknowable. Uh, it's uncharted, uh, we, but we don't like that. And it makes us uncomfortable whether we have tuberculosis or not. And I, I couldn't help thinking as I was reading your book, we're recording this in the middle of the pandemic. And one of the tough parts about a, this pandemic, I think for those of us who are lucky enough to keep our jobs and, and still be healthy, but there's still this question of when's it gonna end? And we really wanna know, we really, and I find myself, foolishly looking at the data, looking for trends and patterns of comfort. And I think the human desire, first of all, for certainty, which we've talked about on the program before in the episode with Robert Burton, and this human desire for control is so powerful that it creates this huge demand for this kind of, of punditry. Well, I think you're exactly right. And it's not surprising that in the same period that, um, you know, Persons and Babson uh, and Fisher are making their names as pundits is also really the the first moment in history where astrology becomes big business. And I sort of toyed with the idea of writing about that and then just thought, you know, I really can't be bothered taking oh. this stuff down. It's so silly. It's a waste of my time. But I think, you know, that of course, this is a period of great volatility, not only market volatility. It's a time of great um, inequality, the Gilded Age, you know, so there are some sort of similarities in mood. But I think you're absolutely right. And, you know, I, I love Robert Burton's work. I think he's really one of the smartest people on this topic out there, you know, from the position of someone who's in, who is a qualified and genuine neurologist, you know. Yeah. But clearly, we do have a passion for certainty. Um, and I think the difficulty of this is that it leaves us wildly susceptible to pundits and prophets and snake oil salesmen um, who sound so confident that we think, well, they must know something that we don't know. And in fact, you know, one of the one of the reasons I wrote this book was because people kept coming up to me and saying, well, you know, in the context of the Brexit referendum in the UK, what's going to happen? In the context of the last presidential election, what's going to happen? And, and I kept thinking, well, why are you asking me? Why do you think <laughs> I know? This is ridiculous, right? Nobody knows. And it just struck me that we have this kind of idea that what these questions embodied was the idea that the future lies behind a locked door and a few special people have the key. And every now and then they're allowed a sneak peek. And those are the people who know. And if you could just find out who they were, and catch five minutes with them, then you'd have this special edge. 
And I thought, this is really magical thinking. And I accept, yeah. you know, and of course, I'm not immune to this. I accept that not knowing is really upsetting. And like you, I'd really like to know when the pandemic's going to end and kind of what it, what the curve is going to end up looking like. Um, but I also think that not knowing and knowing that I don't know, knowing that I can't know, knowing that there aren't any of these special people out there is incredibly liberating because it makes me ask better questions. So what would I do if it were over, you know, next week or next month or September or Christmas, as our prime minister said, um, with a horrible lack of sense of history? Um, you know, or what if it goes on for several years? And so I can run those scenarios in my head and think, okay, in each of those, what would I do? And which of those could I do anyway, regardless of, you know, which what the timeline is? And that gives me a sense that it's not that I know the future, but I have some choices in front of me. And therefore, what my future is going to be, over that I can have some control and I have some agency in a way that if I kind of place my fate in the hands of pundits and forecasters, I really don't. And the other part of their, I think, appeal, and I know this as the host of Econ Talk because I've interviewed many uh, of these folks and I've decided not to interview a bunch of others uh, <laughs> is because people tell me, oh, so-and-so has this really fantastic model of X and you should talk to them. And, and the first time you think about that, you think, wouldn't it be great to have a model of X? Wouldn't it be great to know, say, when the next recession is or how long the recovery is going to last or you know, what interest rates are going to be. And, and we're so, it's so seductive. And I think it's that, um, you know, I spent some time thinking about this because as I mentioned to listeners before, I'm writing a book on a, on a related topic. And I, your book is another book whose title I can't use now, but it's a great, <laughs> it's a great title. And I was thinking about the fact that, you know, when, what, do squirrels go to bed at night thinking, I wonder if I collected too many acorns or too few for the winter. Other than the fact that they're twitching uncontrollably on my bird feeder, which I hate <laughs> as they eat my bird seed, uh, I think they lead a pretty um, serene life at night because they don't, um, they can't imagine the future. And in a way, it's all we can do. We think relentlessly about what's next and what what's at risk mm -hmm. and what's at stake and how will I cope with it? And will it be good? And talk about the role memory plays in this. That you, you, It's very interesting uh, neuroscience that you refer to. Mm. So, uh, you know, very often the, the response to the anxiety that uncertainty provokes is this um, kind of alternative, which is just live in the moment. Just live in the moment. Forget the past. Be a squirrel. The <laughs> just be a squirrel. Exactly. And um, and and that's kind of sounds nice, except that actually we can't. That it's actually one of the sort of signal features of our brain, which is it's constantly creating scenarios of what the next minute, the next hour, the next day, the next month, the next year might look like. And there's a fantastic um, neuroscientist in the UK at the University of London named Eleanor Maguire. And she really made her name, first of all, um, by studying the brains of drivers qualifying for the London cab um, exam, which means that you have to memorize about 25,000 streets within a six mile radius of Charing Cross Station, which is right near Trafalgar Square in the center of London. And what she discovered was that everybody pretty much started from a neuroscientific perspective when she um, scan their brains. Everybody started from pretty much a, a level playing field. Nobody was kind of had a particularly brilliant memory or anything like that. Um, but when they finished, she found that as she scanned their brains, that the people who qualified to be London cab drivers had a significantly enlarged amount of gray matter in their hippocampus, which is responsible for memory. So this was regarded as a great breakthrough demonstrating the neuroplasticity of the brain. So then she became interested in memory and she discovered that people who are amnesiac, so they can't remember the past, also could not imagine the future. 
So if you like, they did Incredible. live in, but in a way that I think none of us would really like to. And what her subsequent work has demonstrated is that actually the way we think about the future is we're retrieving memories and reconfiguring them. So it isn't that, so our brains aren't like computers. Um, we're not retrieving a file. We're kind of reenacting them and reassembling them um, in the present to see the future. So the easiest way to describe this is um, I'm going from my house to in the south of London to my sister's house in the north of London. I have a path I always take, um, but I, I remember that last time there were road work somewhere. And as I'm driving, I also see a sign saying there's road work somewhere else. So I reconfigure my pieces of the route to construct the future route, which I will now take in the present. So we live across all three time zones. We're taking the ingredients from the past, we're rearranging them to create a scenario of the future that gets us to our destination um, on time. And of course, this plays havoc with the legal system, right? When people want to give testimony about so exactly what did happen three and a half months ago. But it's the source of new ideas. It's the source of creative thinking. And it's really what gives us the capacity to change. If you like kind of rearranging all the pieces of the jigsaw to create a new picture. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big fan of, um, of living in the present, but I, I think uh, it's easy to forget, as you say, you can't really live there all the time because there's groceries to buy and children to pick up from school and plans to make if you want to achieve something in your career or with your community or whatever, or your family and so on. So I, I think it's a, uh, it's a balancing act that human beings have to struggle with. And um, very easy, though, for us to either get lost totally in the past, just constantly pulling up unconsciously often just memories that that haunt us or living in the future, imagining things that can't actually happen or are not feasible, but we like them better than where we are now. So we we fantasize about it. But I think, you know, the really one of the really positive things about Eleanor McGuire's work, and there's a huge amount in it that's positive and I think quite inspiring, is that to the degree that you really live in the present, so you really notice what's around you, you really notice the people that you're talking to and you think about what they're saying. In other words, you're really paying attention. You have better ingredients with which to craft these ongoing scenarios of the future. And to the degree that as you're walking down the street, you're looking at your phone and you don't particularly notice where you are and you don't particularly notice the people or the stores or the weather or whatever, you have a pretty depleted stock cupboard. And you know, one of my concerns is that as we get very beguiled by the virtual world, we fail to pay attention to the real world. And therefore, when we come to concoct a new image or a new idea, the cupboard's pretty bare. And so the living in the moment and really are paying attention to where you are and allowing yourself to explore and not necessarily following Google Maps, but actually just wandering around your neighborhood and noticing what's there, who's there, what's happening. This is, if you like, a very, very much more nutritious way of experiencing life than through your phone. Well, I like to think that, but that's partly because I'm 65 years old. I, I think our younger listeners would disagree with you, and I look forward to hearing from them. Uh, I think there are rich things that come from uh, the virtual world, depending on what part of it you dwell in. Uh, but the, the, I want to I want to talk a little bit about two things that you that you really uh, spend some significant time on the book because and they're both fascinating. One is scenario planning, which is what you're you're alluding to, and the second is experimenting. And my I think personally, I want to think about it in my personal life more than say in a business context. When I think about scenario planning in my personal life. 
I, I think it has many of the shortcomings of the virtual world that you're worrying about, which is it's so um, bereft my imagination about where I'm headed, say, in my career or my my personal life. It's so bereft of detail and the richness and texture of that, that using it as a guide for where I want to go, because I don't have in the business world, I got profit. I got to stay in business. I, I may care about things other than profit, but if I don't stay in business, the game's over. So in the business world, there's a metric. The scenario planning, I think, in the personal world is extremely difficult to, to, to implement because I'm not sure where I want to go. And, and I have a limited vision of where I could go. And as time unfolds, I'm going to get more information and learn about opportunities I can't imagine now. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I think, you know, I think scenario planning is simply a way of fully imagining options. So there's a lot of misunderstanding about scenario planning. One is that it's about coming up with different views of the future and then choosing one. That is yeah, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm complaining about, I guess. And, and that's not what it's about. It's really about coming up with a number of different scenarios of the future and then interrogating each one and saying, okay, if scenario one were to come true, what would I wish I had been doing right now in order to put myself in a stronger position for that eventuality? And similarly with, you know, scenario two, three, and four. And so what, it's, what it really is at its best at is surfacing choice, choices, options, and alternatives. And I think actually it is quite possible to, to live with this. I remember, oh, I don't know, probably 2010 to 2012, having a, a number of arguments with my husband about um, when the next banking crash would be. And it suddenly struck me, this was just a stupid argument, right? Because neither of us knew, you know, no little eco, e, e, you know, economic fairy had sprinkled gold dust on us. And, um, and I said, okay, let's ask a different question. Let's ask the question, if there is another banking crash, or when there is another banking crash, what will we wish we had been doing right now? And we thought through that in some pretty gritty detail about where we would want our investments to be, um, where we would want to be, what resources we would want to have. Um, and so we, you know, we slightly changed some of the things we were doing. We accelerated some things. We put other things on hold. And what it did is it left us feeling, okay, we don't know what the future is, but we think we've placed ourselves in a reasonably robust context. And actually that's pretty much all we can do. So we can stop having this stupid argument for a start and get on and enjoy our lives, you know, feeling that to the degree that it's possible, we've done the responsible things. I think that's a great thought. And I think uh, especially looking at the downside of, of those potential calamities, preparing for those seems like a good idea. I'm sure a lot of I know a lot of Americans have increased their inventory of tuna uh, in the in, in the can tuna fish uh, because if the pandemic gets worse again and there's shortages in the store it's dangerous to go to the grocery at least I'll have uh, a couple dozen cans of tuna fish uh, and and that's a silly example but it's indicative of what we're talking about which is part of it is when you get a knock on the head you start worrying about what might when it might happen again. But part of it is just realizing, as you said, when it happens, it's not what's important. It's the fact that it probably is going to happen. And maybe I showed a little more cash in the case of investing, et cetera. We don't give investment advice on this program. Of course, consult with your financial advisor. But um, let's talk about experiments, because I think experiments are greatly underrated. I, I, two things happen to hap come, happen while while I was reading your book. One is I interviewed Matt Ridley about his book, How Innovation Works. And you realize that so many of the great discoveries of our, of our lives that we live by are not because some genius saw some magical solution. They just kept trying until something worked. They kept throwing stuff at the wall. And the second thought 
I had this week was that Jeff Bezos testified in front of uh, Congress. And in an extraordinary document, uh, in his testimony, he defended Amazon uh, and he defended America along the way, which was kind of kind of interesting. But his, one of his sub themes in that document was how many times Amazon has failed, that they have lost billions of dollars through failure, experiments that didn't make it. And the ones that did make it, like their cloud services, a lot of people thought it was a waste of time. A distraction turned out to be an enormous victory for them. So talk about experimentation in general, and then particularly if there's any role it can play in our personal lives. So I think, you know, I, I think I'm not surprised by, you know, what Bezos says, because the willingness to do experiments without gaming the outcome um, and to try something because you genuinely do not know what will happen is, you know, it's fundamental to innovation. But I think in many, many of the corporations that I've worked with, it's absolutely not what they do. They don't want to do an experiment until they feel kind of 90% confident it'll be what they want it to be. And we've also seen I think what I think of as the rise of incrementalism, which is, I'm going to call it experiment, but it's not really. And the way I think about this is, well, you know, we used to have vanilla, you know, Oreos, traditional, you know, chocolate biscuit and the vanilla filling. And then we innovated and at Halloween, it's an orange filling and St. Patrick's Day, it's a green filling, you know, and Easter, it's a purple filling. This is not experimentation, right? This is no. real lame, lame um, incrementalism. And I think a great deal of what passes for innovation in many corporations is that. And it's because nobody wants to make the gamble. Nobody wants to invest the time or effort. And there is, you know, as much as people often say there isn't, there is this sort of sense that, well, if you fail, that's a failure and you'll have wasted time, effort and money. And that's the worst thing you can do. So everybody stays on the, on the right path. And I think we've seen that nowhere so brutally as in retail, where everybody has been very happy to use Amazon as the scapegoat for their own failure, but actually you've seen an absolute dearth of experimentation in bricks and water retail. I mean, I'm just astounded at how everybody sat there petrified doing pretty much nothing except what they're used to, which is, yay, let's compete on cost. That'll be fantastic, you know, and it's absurd. It's absurd. So there are two experiments, I guess, that I'm, you know, most fond of in the book. Um, one of them is about a Dutch uh, home care nursing organization. And there are a lot of uh, healthcare experiments, you know, in my book, as you know, because everybody's trying to figure out how can we do this better for less. Yep. Um, so in the, Hol in, in the Netherlands, which is, you know, I'm also fond of this because I grew up in the Netherlands, but um, a huge amount of the healthcare system revolves around home care nursing because we know that when pe if people can get home from, from the hospital sooner, they recover better in general. Um, so a lot of emphasis is placed on this. And they used to do it the way that it's certainly done in many, many places, which is you were allocated a nurse for a certain amount of time, you know, sort of five minutes on Monday, seven minutes on Wednesday, nine minutes on Friday. It was covered by an insurance company that strictly defined exactly what you paid for. And, um, and everybody hated it, the nurses and the patients both. And a very interesting guy who is both an economist and a nurse, which is, you know, pretty unusual combination. Yep. Said, this is so hateful. Let's just try something different. And he had a very brilliant insight, I think, which is he said, actually, this looks like one piece of work, but it's actually really two. There's one part which is complicated, which means it's very predictable and it's the same every time. And that's about the contract, the assignment of the nurse, the Get handing out of invoices, the collecting of money, all that kind of stuff. He said, let's use, you know, that's predictable. Let's use technology to streamline that, let's make it super, super, super efficient because technology is best at things that are repeatable. The thing that's complex is the patient because even two patients that leave the same hospital for, at the same moment with the same condition, they will recover at different rates. So they are inherently unpredictable predictable. The patients are complex, not complicated. So we can't say how much time they're going to need on what day. That's ridiculous. So let's just say to the nurses, do what you think is right. 
you're a nurse, use your judgment. And the outcome of this experiment was that the cost of this kind of, this style of, of home care nursing fell by 30% because the patients got better in half the time as audited by EY. And what's so striking about this, when I asked him, you know, what was what surprised you about this experiment? And he just burst out laughing. He said, I had no idea you could make such a huge difference so easily. You know, you could never have cut cost to this outcome, ever. Um, you had to kind of break the complex and the complicated apart. And I think it was EY who estimated that if you applied this same thing to US, US healthcare, it would save, and I think I'm right, um, something in the region of $45 billion a year. I mean, it's just a massive, massive return for a very simple experiment. But it's not an incremental experiment, right? It's just, I don't know what would happen. The only way to find out is let's do it. I, I hate to say this, but to some extent, $45 billion is a little bit like a deck chair on the Titanic. But it is real money, $45 billion. It, it's, it is real money. Um, it's also happier patients. You know, and actually, yeah. that's kind of what health care is about. And happier nurses, too, I'm sure, who felt more agency, joy from their job instead of following a set of, of requirements. And Exactly. Exactly. So and let's think about. Go ahead. No, the the other experiment is you know is one that was carried out at the Bank of England by the chief data officer who was in a position I think many um, executives are in, which is the volume of work is going to increase exponentially. Oh, by the way, the resources won't shrinking. Yeah, and um, you know instead of doing what lots of executives do, you know, uh, go for a weekend in a swanky hotel somewhere and try to figure it out. You know, he just said to the whole team, this is where we are. I want any idea I can get for how to improve our, our productivity. And they came from all over the place. You know, people who said, well, if we understood the strategy better, we'd be more productive. So we want to sit in on the um, leadership team weekly meeting. So he said, fine. Made no difference at all. Everybody discovered they're really boring. So forget it. Another suggestion, um, the appraisal system stinks. It's, you know, nobody believes it. Let's change it completely. That made a huge difference in terms of people feeling they were seen and that they mattered and they had a career. Um, some very young engineers kind of almost at the bottom of the hierarchy come up with a different way of tagging the data. It's a 10x improvement. And 10X, so, lots wow. these, so lots of these ideas came and kept coming and kept coming. So that solved his problem. So that's a great experiment. But what he said to me, I think, was really interesting, which were two things. One, he realized in doing this experiment, where all his colleagues were saying, oh, this is pretty edgy, you're going to get in trouble. Um, actually, it made him a hero. He had much more freedom in his institution than he had realized. And the other thing he said is, you know, I, I always thought strategy was, you know, the, the province of the, uh, the higher ups. And actually said, I realized that great strategic ideas have, are no respecter of hierarchy. They were all over the place. And there was just a huge amount of talent, talent that I hadn't been using. That's a really great finding from an, an experiment that cost really nothing. Well, it's an example of leveraging the knowledge that the people throughout an organization have, that the people at the top can't have, literally can't have, giving them the voice to express those ideas using the knowledge they have and then giving them the, again, the sense of agency that, that their suggestions could be tried is such a, such a obviously good idea, uh, but hard often for people in a hierarchy to, to stomach. So it's a, it's a great example. But I want to talk, I want to turn to our personal, so that's in a business context or policy context. And I think trial and error is greatly undervalued there, underrated. And a part of it is fear of failure, as you said, fear of being blamed. Um, there, there's a, Especially as the organization gets bigger, they get more, obviously they get more cautious. And I think Bezos is to be saluted to the extent that he can still maintain that, what he calls a day one mentality that they, that they have to experiment and stay ahead of their rivals, uh, which I think is, is just fascinating. But I'm interested in the personal context 
you know, it's very hard, I think, for individuals to, quote, try stuff, even though it's just trying it. It's not committing to it. Obviously, a, a primitive example of this is dating. Dating is a way we try to get an idea of what marriage is like. But it seems to me that in the career field and in the uh, how we think about our life unfolds outside of our families, career, uh, social activities, uh, community work that we do that, that we hope will make the world a better place, we don't do much experimentation. And I think it's undervalued in, in our daily lives a little bit. I think it's hugely undervalued. And I'm really struck by the number of people that I know or have interviewed who've had tremendous careers. And when you dig into how did they do that, the answer is absolutely not, this is how I planned it. It's the yeah. exact opposite. It's like, well, I tried this and I didn't like it, so I tried that. So, you know, I interviewed, I mean, just sort of some random examples, um, a youngish woman who all her life she'd wanted to be a doctor. And so she went to med school and she became a doctor and she discovered she really hates patients. <laughs> So, but you know, it all was not lost. She went on to do medical research and now she really loves that. So that's okay. Another uh, young woman who went into PR decided that was really flaky and went and trained as a lawyer and now has a very successful career as a family lawyer, um, handling divorces, which, you know, strangely enough, if anything, are a, are a boom industry post pandemic. Um, and, and her brother who really wanted to be a lawyer who worked in a law office for a year and thought, oh, yikes, I can't stand these stuffy lawyers, you know, but he really loves sport. And now he works for one of the world's, you know, premier sports marketing businesses. And there's a, a fantastic woman in, in my book, you know, who had a whole series of illnesses when she was young uh, with the result that she you know, never got any real educational qualifications, never went to university, ended up doing digital marketing for De Beers then ended up doing digital marketing and count or digital communications for anti-terrorism measures working for the UK government and now lives in Pennsylvania doing digital marketing for all sorts of online businesses. You know, none of this is planned. It's all about experiments. And yeah, I would so say even of, even of myself, I would say, you know, I started off wanting to be a theater director. I ended up working at the BBC. I was very successful, very young. And so by the time I was 35, I thought, wow, there has to be more to life than this, you know, and, and moved to the United States where I spent nine years running tech companies and then moved back to the UK where, you know, I've been writing and advising CEOs around the world. You know, this is a, what they call here a very squiggly career. And it's all about experiments. You know, I went, I fetched up in Boston without a clue what I was going to do. It seems to me this is related to this issue of um, of control and uncertainty that we talked about before. I remember, I think I was 14 and a classmate of mine asked me what I was going to major in in college. And I said, I have no idea. And he said, well, you have to know soon. And of course, you really don't even have to know after a year or two at college, in America at least. I think in, in, in the UK, it's a little more regimented. In other countries, it's a little more regimented. But I think it's one of the great gifts of the United States, our culture and other our institutions, that we don't force people to pick a career path early. And we let people deviate it from it early and often. I remember going home to my dad and saying, Dad, do I have to know? He said, no, of course you don't have to know. And it was a great relief off my mind. But I think if you're worried about the future and the uncertainty, knowing I'm going to major in this and then I'm going to do that. And I mentioned this before, I have a son who's a philosophy major and people say, well, what, what's that good for? And the answer is thinking, um, pretty valuable skill. Uh, but, but the idea that it doesn't have a clear career thing like dentist or accountant at the end of it, 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 it scares people and they can't, it's hard to deal with. Yeah. Well, it does scare people, but I think, you know, the truth is that you don't, you know, when you're 18, 19, whatever, you don't know who you're going to be. Yeah. And so how can you possibly make this decision at a moment in your life where A, you don't know you, and B, you have often have very little experience of work, so you don't really understand what any of the options are. <laughs> and the only way to find out, a bit like the healthcare experiment, is you just try stuff. And you discover the kinds of environments in which you're happy, the kinds of colleagues that you like having. And, 
also you have to bear in mind, and this is especially true now that in general, you know, human life spans are increasing, um, that you may love something as I loved broadcasting for 13 years and then think, yeah, I really love it, but wow, I don't want to spend the next half of my life doing the same old things. Um, so I want to try something different. And I think that, you know, if, if my kids are all going to live to be 100, um, they have to have a love of learning and enough curiosity to have several careers. And so it seems to me that certainly when thinking about education, the prime thing we want to instill in children is not knowledge per se, which will keep shifting, but a love of learning and being really, really good at learning and thinking that this is fun, not something that you just want to get over with as soon as humanly possible. Yeah, I very well said. I think your dad sounds great. <laughs> He's even better than that because uh, when, uh, another classmate asked, asked me what, we were we were talking about what we wanted to be when we grew up, and he said, uh, "Well, he was going when he went to college. He was going to study Latin." And I said, "Well, that's interesting." Again, I'm about 15 years old at this point, and I, I actually remember his name. I'm not going to use it on the air, but it's interesting. It wasn't a close friend of mine, but this conversation stuck with me. He said he was he was going to study Latin. I said, "Why?" He said, "Well, I want to be a lawyer, and there's a lot of Latin phrases in in law." And I thought. Well, that, ooh, really? And I uh, can't ask my dad. And he said, mm, it's just a short list and you kind of memorize it. So my dad was full of, full of wisdom. I was very lucky. I, I would have changed I would have changed gears here. And I want to talk about uh, a section of the book, which I, I really especially loved, which was uh, the idea of being an artist. We had um, Arza Raza on this program talking about uh, dying like an artist. She talked about in her book, The First Cell, you know, some of her patients, uh, how gracefully they they dealt with their last time on, on earth and that there was an artistry about it. And you talk about how to live like an artist. And I, I, I love that idea. Um, I think it's uh, it's pretty ambitious. So talk about what you mean by that and uh, how we can live like an artist. Well, first of all, I'm really glad you enjoyed the the chapter because, um, you know, my editor sort of asked me, did I think it was really essential? And it's a bit, a bit like asking you, you know, are all your children really necessary? Right? Yeah, don't they understand? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, so, so I'm grateful to you for that. The reason that's in there is because when I worked in broadcasting, I had the huge pleasure of working with a lot of really outstanding artists, writers, playwrights actors, musicians, visual artists. And I started noticing lots of things about them. And one of them was that uh, quite a lot of them were fantastically good at doing something today that ended up being exactly what people wanted two to three years hence. And I was just constantly puzzling how they did that. And it wasn't about prediction. It was, they were fantastic sense makers and they generally wandered around is really kind of the simple answer, which is they really paid attention to where they were and what people were thinking and what, what different things they saw change. And they were constantly kind of mulling over this and thinking, what does it mean? What does it mean? What is it? What's on people's nerve endings, you know? And they necessarily lived in a context of uncertainty. They didn't know if they were going to make enough money to live on this year. They didn't know when they started a work, whether it would be finishable, if it would be any good, if the public would like it. Um, they weren't kind of trying to game the system. They weren't trying to please the market. They were kind of going, they had a tremendous sense of agency and a desire to make something meaningful. So they were constantly thinking about, what does this mean? What does this mean? What does this mean? And I think it's from that kind of way of being that they derive the, the capacity to create work today that may last for decades or hundreds of years. And, um, and so they're not stuck in a prison of a brand of thinking, well, I'm this kind of person, I've got to do this kind of work. They have a great sense of freedom and imagination. And of course, they have quite a lot of courage in terms of starting something which they don't know how it will finish. And I think of all of these, the one who took my breath away most is uh, my friend, the novelist, Sebastian Barry, 
who um, started a book, started writing it for nine months, and then um, threw it all out and started again, a completely new style, a completely new chapter, and a prize-winning book. And I just think, oh my God, you know, the, the notion of throwing away nine months' work just is like a dagger through my heart. But, you know, he was just, of course, what he would say is the nine months' work was not wasted. He had to do all of that work to come to the first sentence that he wrote in the, you know, in the final book. And so I think that kind of courage to keep thinking, you know, is it right? Is it right? Is it right? Does it feel right? Does it really honor what I'm trying to do? What am I trying to do? You know, this is what Hannah Arendt calls having a conversation with yourself, which is how she defines thinking. Yeah. And I'm so impressed by the capacity artists have to tolerate uncertainty. And it isn't that it isn't, or, or, uh, pay, it's not that it's painless for them. The um, artist Tracy Emin says before she starts a painting, she's often so nervous, she has to sketch a bit to kind of get herself kind of courageous enough to do the first stroke. So it isn't that it's painless for them, but they just, they can't not do it. And they can't not walk down the streets and think about what does it mean. And so I think there's a lot for us to learn, not that we can all be artists, but we can think like artists. We can um, be these kind of sense makers that artists are. And I think that's both enriching of life and enriching of work. I think, uh, I think it was Kafka who said, uh, I threw myself into the story, even though it might cut me to pieces. You know, there's a, a certain vulnerability that an artist has to live with also that I think is really important. Um, but the part I really like that seems like a small thing I want to just emphasize, and it comes back to our earlier conversation, it's the ability to pay attention. And we think of, you think of a great writer as somebody who's, who's a good, good at writing. A great sculptor is good with a, a knife, a great or a brush. A great artist, uh, a great musician is good with you know with notes. But so much of great art comes from what I would call just paying attention, looking at how people behave, looking for a moment of poetry in daily life that you might capture in a story or a novel. And I think one way to, for me, the way I try to resolve or live with the tension between living in the moment versus living with an eye toward the future is that if you pay attention, you can live in the present in a way that doesn't preclude living into the future. In fact, it's going to make the future richer. You know, you and I are having a conversation. I'm trying to listen to what you have to say. And by doing that, uh, I make it, I hope, Obviously, I hope I'm making something together with you that listeners will enjoy and learn from and, and find interesting. But we're also having a moment together that's just itself, just this two people connecting. We're about, I don't know, 5,000 miles, 4,000 miles apart. It's really a, an extraordinary thing. And I'm just going to enjoy that for a minute. And I'm going to pay attention to your uniqueness, right? And it's not just, oh, she had a lot of interesting things to say, which is true. But there's a 50 other things that if I'm not paying attention, I miss about the human experience. And I think I think an artist is does that naturally. I don't I think it comes naturally to a great artist. It's just, you know, I think about somebody like Faulkner, who, you know, has this unbelievable rich view of, of human nature, what he called the human heart in conflict with itself. How, how do you capture that? Well, you pay attention and you're a good writer, too, obviously. But that's the paying attention part gets forgotten. Yeah, it does. And it's really interesting the way that so many great writers walk. They just walk cities. They walk yeah. the countryside and they're just looking and there's no goal. It's not like I have to go out and research this. You know, they're just paying attention. And it's so interesting that you mentioned Faulkner because there's a line. I mean, there are two lines, actually, in um, from Light in August that are germane to this. One is, and I think it's chapter six, but I may be wrong about that. <laughs> being knows before knowing remembers, which is, if you like. Say of, that again. Say that again. Being knows before knowing remembers. So it's Explain. like we absorb, we absorb these sensations and they're sort of unconscious before we then notice them. 
and then their memories. So it's a sort of perfect encapsulation of Eleanor Maguire's work about how our mind works, that we sweep these things up and then we kind of pay attention to them and then they become memories. And the other thing which shows, you know, shows him doing just that is I remember there's a character in Light in August and he describes her as have, wearing her hair as a bun, which was like a wart on the top of her head. And it's just such a fantastic description, you know, and you think he's seen this somewhere and you don't sure. know where he's seen it, but he's seen it somewhere because you just think, how, how else could you come up with such a, I mean, you just can see this woman now. The same way that he could see that woman that he must have seen somewhere. And I think this act of, of wandering and noticing, I mean, Saul Bellow says, you know, be a great noticer. And I think this is the thing I found in all the artists that I had the pleasure of working with, all the artists I've, you know, had the joy of writing about. Um, Ibsen, you know, just a phenomenal noticer and the world, you know, world champion gossip, you know, there's sort of nothing is beneath his notice, but he's, you know, one of his, I think his daughter-in-law said, you always had to tell him a story twice because the first time he was interested in the story and the second time he's interested in the detail. And it's, you know, as Nora Ephron would say, it's all copy. It's all what copy? Yeah. Yeah, meaning material. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but uh, you don't, the thing is, it's not collected with a purpose. It's right. just, it goes back to what we were talking about earlier. It just kind of goes into the store cupboard of your mind for when you might need it, rather yeah. like the tuna, right? <laughs> yeah, I, I, I'm thinking about Ryan Holiday, who likes to take a lot of note cards and notes of quotes that he likes. So I've interviewed him a number of times on the program. Or Nassim Nicholas Taleb, who likes to talk about being a flaneur, one who just strolls aimlessly. And, you know, we've kind of lost the art of that, obviously, because when we stroll aimlessly now, we're looking, usually we're looking at our phone. Uh, and, 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 and there is. Right. And we usually have a destination in mind. True. And I think, you know, the thing I see with some dismay is. You know, my friends who will plan, you know, in the days when we used to travel, you know, we'll plan, let's say, a week, a weekend in Barcelona and they'll, you know, research the hotel and book it and research the restaurants and book it and research the best sites and book tickets for that. And they'll figure out the best walks and all this sort of stuff. And, you know, by the time they get on the plane to go, I think they may as well not even bother because what yeah. they're going to do is they're going to see a generic Barcelona. They've already seen it in their heads. And what they're not allowing themselves to do, what their schedule won't allow themselves to do, is just step outside and wander around and see what's what and figure it out from there and let Barcelona happen to you. Yeah. But they have already foreclosed that possibility. And they think they're being fantastically efficient, but in foreclosing uncertainty, they've really left out finding their Barcelona. Yeah, there's a trade-off there, obviously. I, I'm, I'm big on, I, it's a matter, I think a lot of it's personal taste. I like to go to a city and just literally walk around. I, I, that's my favorite thing. Uh, I do end up going to a museum or two, but you know, if you're not careful, if you don't make the reservation in advance, you can't get into that museum. Of course, that's not the biggest loss uh, often. You're, you're going to see something else that you like, but I'm going to now, I think, you know, as a metaphor for life, uh, finding your own Barcelona, I think, is a really great idea. And I, I, I've mentioned this on the program before. I think a lot of young people today do feel this urgency to plan out and map out their their future. And I think some of that comes from the nature of the world today and, and the uncertainty that people have to deal with student loans and other things. But also, I, I worry comes from our technology, which promises this uh, this illusion of uh, of a, a secure world with less uncertainty. And they, we, if we're not careful, I think we buy into that, and we program our vacation the way we program our trip uh, via ways. You know, I just oh, here are the turns. You know, here's the restaurant, here's the museum, and then we've got to stop and look at this particular bridge. <laughs> Oh, and if I do it right, we can we can fit in this other thing over here, this statue we're supposed to see when we're there. Um, I had the great gift when I went to um, 
to London for the first time, one of my English friends said, uh, I said, what should I do? He said, well, well, the British Museum, of course. And and then he listed five or six other things that he recommended. And I almost when he said the British Museum, of course, I kind of thought, well, well, I guess not realizing it's the greatest museum in the world. And I got there with no expectations and saw 50 things that just blew me away. It was one of the most glorious things because I hadn't consulted the guidebook. I hadn't said, well, I've only got three hours there. I've got to make sure I see this, this, this and this. And it was just great. So stumbling onto things. And as a metaphor, again, I think for life, career uh, and experience, I think is uh, it's good advice. Yeah. And what a wonderful way to experience the British Museum. Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, I remember going into a, a, a somewhat smaller museum in London and, and kind of wandering around. It was a kind of weird mixture of things. Um but I remember walking into one room and right opposite me was this painting by Anselm Kiefer. And it just had this kind of gravitational pull. It just sucked you in. And you thought, oh, my God, what is that? You know, and that's an electrifying moment when a picture kind of reaches out and grabs you by the scuff, scuff of the neck and says, look at me. Look at me and think about what this is. And that's the whole point, right? of going to the museum, not saying, okay, there are three Van Goghs, I've seen those, two Rembrandts. Now, where are the two Rembrandts? Because I have to see those, you know, before I leave. You know, just allow yourself to discover. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, that's, that's exactly right. So I have to confess that when I did get to the British Museum, I did get the list of 10 things you have to, you should see if you, if you only have a few hours at the British Museum. But I stopped and I wandered into the room that was full of clocks and watches, which wasn't on the list. It was one of my favorite things. It was amazing. This room with these incredible clocks. And they probably have 400,000 more in the back room that they haven't put out lately. They just probably rotate them. It's just fantastic. Um, the other thing like that, you know, I went to the Muse Musée d'Orsay recently in Paris. I was lucky to be able to go there. And I think that's my favorite art museum in the world. And there are many glorious, famous things there. But there's a room in that museum that has some paintings that are, I don't know, they're like, I'm going to guess and say they're like 30 by 40 feet. That was part of my favorite parts. Again, I just wandered into that room and I could have missed it even, you know, make sure I saw all the famous things. And I just think it's important in life to leave time for those, those surprises. Definitely. And I think that's, you know, that's how you have your own experiences. That's how you become aware of yourself and where you are and how you're changing. And that's what informs the decisions that you'll make about your own future, is being alert to yourself and to the world. And to the degree that you are really most alert to your phone, I think everybody becomes rather the same. And I remember, you know, actually thinking this several times before the pandemic and being on the subway in London and thinking everybody looks the same. You know, they've all got the same style, the same hairdo, the same eyebrows. You know, and this is what I think of as the sort of Instagram effect, which is everybody can see what's what, and they're all copying it. And it's kind of horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's kind of horrible. And it's just like, oh, for heaven's sakes, you know, put your phone down, go offline, find yourself in weird details and special things that you and you alone will notice. Uh, let's close and talk about death, appropriate for a final subject. Um, you talk about the virtues of not living forever. You know, we live in a culture, uh, you particularly talk about Silicon Valley, a, a phrase I hadn't heard before. Uh, I'm gonna, let me see if I can pronounce it correctly. The Methuselarity. Yes. It's a cross <laughs> between singularity and Methuselah. Yeah. And uh, it's a reference to uh, Aubrey de Grey. And of course, there's a natural human impulse, which I certainly am sympathetic to, which is death isn't any good. It's bad. I want to live longer. Uh, and that this, you know, that, that you could see medicine itself is, is an attempt to overturn this, to fix it. Um, but you also su you suggest that death can be experienced in a different way. And of course, that affects how we experience life. Talk about that. Yeah. Um, I guess this came to me in, in several ways. One was thinking that the whole Silicon Valley desire to live forever was, you know, 
just useless. You know, if you want to use all this great brain power, do something useful, like figure out why longevity is declining in many parts of the United States, you know, fix the healthcare system, you know, fix climate change, do something useful. And it struck me- Well, they're working on that. They're working on that too. You got to give them some credit, but go ahead. I take your point. (laughs) But, you know, that's a crisis in a way that, you know, for getting rich people to live a little bit longer is really not a crisis. Um, And it struck me that actually we don't want people to live forever. We wouldn't have wanted Pol Pot to live forever. We wouldn't have wanted Hitler to live forever. I dare say we have some political leaders in the world today that we would be absolutely horrified by the notion that they would never die. They would never go away. Um, so, So I thought the idea of living forever was kind of fundamentally fatuous. But I was also very struck by the number of people I've known and I know them well, because I think otherwise we wouldn't have had these conversations, who as much as they love their parents, realized after they stopped grieving for them, that they had a, a large sense of freedom. And it wasn't that they were bitter or at all angry about the way in which they had consciously or unconsciously aimed to please their parents, but that when their parents were no longer there, then it was just them deciding who they were, where they wanted to spend Christmas, um, what they wanted to do with their lives. That, you know, the subtle ways in which we all absorb our parents' judgment it was gone. And it was wonderful. And I thought, you know, of course, like any parent, I love my children to bits. And the thing that upsets me about the idea of my death is that I know it will upset them. And I really love not to upset them. But I also feel that after they've stopped grieving for me, they will have me in them in terms of learning and experiences and memories and things we've shared together and things they know about me and things they know about my parents whom they never knew. And that in that way, I would do live forever, but in a way that's free for them and that they will shape in their heads as the free individuals I have always wanted them to be. And that seems to me the very best gift I can leave them. And so I think this notion of trying to hang around forever with just an accumulated sense or accumulating sense of losses of habits I love that people no longer have, or grammar I love that people no longer use, or systems or places or companies or products that I loved and that are no that are obsolete or gone. You know, this accumulation of losses, you know, kind of century after century is such a terrible idea. Whereas the notion of using the time we have carefully with real value and seeing it as precious, and seeing the last gift to one's friends and family as leaving those memories with them to make of what they want. I think that's quite inspiring for me. Couldn't agree more. My guest today has been Margaret Hefford, and her book is Uncharted. Margaret, thanks for being part of Econ Talk. Well, thank you for a really wonderful and, dare I say it, really memorable conversation. Thanks, Margaret. Thank you. This is Econ Talk, part of the Library of Economics and Liberty. For more Econ Talk, go to econtalk.org, where you can also comment on today's podcast and find links and readings related to today's conversation. The sound engineer for Econ Talk is Rich Goyette. I'm your host, Russ Roberts. Thanks for listening. Talk to you on Monday.